The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. Ben, it has been almost an entire year since we first met Terry and saw his Nintendo PlayStation prototype. Oh yeah, that was MGC, the Midwest Gaming Classic, 2016. And back then, shortly thereafter, we invited them onto the show so we could try to fix it. And we got some things fixed, but it wasn't completely working. Yep, and then we worked on it again when we met them at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo in fall 2016. So now we're gonna see if we can get it working all the way. All the things working all the time. Terry dropped it off to us, so we have about a month to work on it behind the scenes leading up to MGC. 2017, so hopefully we can give it back to him at the show, working. Well, let's see what kind of progress we can make. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired designs. Imhotep's priests. Regrettable acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. There's two digital analog converters on this prototype. One of them is for the Super Nintendo side and one of them is for the CD-ROM side. And then I think they are, they are mucks together after that, which is kind of weird. I mean, you'd think they would have CD audio as a possibility to play in the background. Well, whatever. Anyway, I've got it hooked up to the scope and I'm going to look at the Super Nintendo side of it. So I've got the scope hooked up to the Super Nintendo DAC. What we see here, this is the music for Super Mario Kart. Okay, so the center line, that is the data. And you can see it just looks more like a signal. There's actually things coming out of it. So once again, the yellow at the top, that is the clock. The data is the cyan in the middle and the magenta at the bottom is the left and right channel. So basically does the left channel then the right channel, left channel, right channel, just you know, continually streams it over. Yeah, I mean, this actually looks like good data here because we know the Super Nintendo DAC is working. We should see some negative numbers as well if we can catch it. I'm gonna just hook, up back, hook back up to the um, CD-ROM DAC and we shouldn't see anything there. Yep, so the CD-ROM is not trying to run. Did it even boot? No, nope, it says no disk. I kind of get the feeling that the CD-ROM on this thing is pretty, pretty borked. <laughs> we've, really, we've really seen very little signs of life. And when it does work, it doesn't work correctly. I've been doing some mapping of the schematic and I think I know what this mystery chip does. It's probably some sort of bus, well, not really a bus arbiter, but it's probably a bus location decoder chip. So I've noticed that someone has mapped out what registers you send data to off the expansion port. So I think what this chip does, it says, oh, you've sent you know, such and such a register, then I'll let you talk to this chip, or I'll let you talk to this chip, or I'll let you talk to the thing on the CD-ROM's LCD. So yeah, I'm just gonna continue mapping out this chip. I've got it about halfway, and that will help me solve some of the mysteries, and it'll give me more points from which I can test things. Okay, so this is weird. Um, I was working on this yesterday and the CD-ROM wasn't even detecting the disc. I came in this morning and jiggled the cables around and got ready to work on it some more. And all of a sudden it works. Cause I was looking at it on the scope. I was looking at the signals coming off of the CD-ROM. Then I connected it to the DAC and I saw there was a lot more solid signals and I'm like, oh, I should plug in my headphones. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, well, I'll probably get a copyright flag for this, but. Uh That's weird, because I was just, what changed? Is it like a magical elf come in overnight? Maybe, maybe these ribbon cables have some issues. That could be part of it. I should maybe double check that and see if I can get replacements. But what I have learned by reading all the documents is this. So there's a CD-ROM controller chip, and then there's a digital signal processor, and then there's also a microcontroller here on this board. So when the system is not in game mode, this microcontroller tells the CD-ROM controller, which is on the motherboard, not on the CD-ROM, it tells it what to do, such as play music and whatnot. And uh, yeah, at the moment, it's, uh, it's working. 
I did put that cap on. There was one bad cap there. I can't imagine that would have made that much of a difference. Okay, now we're gonna try some modern hipster music. What, it, Mumford and Sons? Sigh no more. Okay. I still don't know why this is working. Okay, 12 tracks, 48 minutes. Does that sound about right? Yeah, there's a bit of a glitch. Like it played the first track, then it skipped and then it resumed. So I think it might still be a little off. It sounds like coffee shop music. Yeah, I'll try 12 tracks play. Let's see if we can turn it to shuffle mode. Shuffle mode. Okay, for some reason it's working now. Uh, I'm gonna check the ribbon cables. They might have something to do with it. Although I don't know why they would have been really damaged. They've just been sitting around for 20 years. I'm also gonna go in and take uh, measurements from the three potentiometers on the driver board for the disc, just to make sure we know what the working number is. And then we can tweak it a little bit further. There were a few tracks on the newer CD by Mumford and Sons. Well, there's one track where it was a little, it was like it skipped a little bit, but then it found its footing. There is uh, like 32K of RAM in the controller chip, which is jitter control. That's what they would do back in the day. Like if you had the disc man, it had uh, basically a buffer in it. So if you were like jogging or something, or like counting your money in the 80s in your corporate office because you're Gordon Gecko, it would, you know, it was basically a skip buffer. But then uh, once we have the drive consistent, then I can try to re-enable the CD-ROM system to see if we can get the uh, CD-ROM bootstrap program on this cartridge to actually load a game. And we have that super boss Gaiden, or Gaiden, Gaiden. Yeah, it's not Gaiden. Ninja Gaiden. Because when in the 80s we called it Ninja Gaiden, but it's Gaiden. Because my, my friend was like all into j j Japanese things and he was like, actually, it's, it's Gaiden, and it means side story. All right, well, I'm gonna just check a few more things with this, get the pot adjustments, and then we can try to get it to boot. Okay, I haven't broken it yet, so now I'm gonna try to see if I can get a disc to boot up. Now, we did have some problems before where it was like, you know, no CD system. Uh, so there still might be some jumpers or some sort of bodge wire that's going to prevent that from working. But at least we know the CD-ROM is now working, which means if there is a problem, it's somewhere else in the system. So we just eliminate potential problems and hopefully are only left with the solution. Spared no expense. <laughs> My pet dinosaur is a dead. Mario can stop running. <laughs> you know. Whoa, whoa. We got something different on the screen. Get the screen. Whatever. Now. Get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. No disc. Access, music disc. Hmm, progress. All right, take it one step at a time. Let's do a self check. Music check is working. Let's see if we can talk to the CXD 1800. Okay, communication. Looks like, oh, okay, this is a test program. Oh, we, we can put in uh, hex code. Uh, but I have a list of commands that I found off the internet. Oh, here we go. Open, close. Okay, that one works. Track list, fast forward, fast reverse forward. There's also commands here for getting data, and that's what it would actually use to load a game. Yeah, for some reason, play's not working. Well, I think I've had enough testing. Let's stick in a game. Let's do it. <laughs> I gotta get the old disc out. No disc, access, music disc, eject. Whoop. How come it can't tell me what the disc music is like my iPod can? Hashtag fail. Well, if you see it says tray open, it's actually getting status back from the, from the system. All right, let's see what happens. Push start, hey. Now loading. Come on, you can do it, you can do it. I did think that this thing probably would have long load times. I guess we'll see. Well, it's definitely in the 90s. We're waiting for a CD game to load. Of course, this has never been tried on real hardware before. This is taking forever. I remember back when we did our first teardown of this, the cartridge appeared to have, I was pretty sure, 256K of RAM, and the uh, Super Boss Gaiden image looks like a 512K image. So I was kind of wondering if maybe it was overloading itself, like it, uh, the person who did the emulator or whatever didn't realize the actual RAM that was in the cartridge and therefore maybe it was basically going past the end and starting over again. So I found another ISO called Magic Floor, which was from No Cache's site, and I burned that onto a disk, making sure everything was in the right place. There's a header file at sector 16 and the data starts slowly after that. Let's try it again. This one should load pretty quick, it's like 40K. Now loading, and it does something. 
Hey, there we go. I don't know how to play this game though. Now keep in mind, no one's actually made games for this actual hardware. This was programmed for an emulator. Okay, magic floor, and there's points. Okay, I don't know how to, oh. Oh, these must be the different modes. probably look up the instructions on how to play this game, but you know what? That doesn't really matter because we did it. We got the super CD system to load a CD-ROM based game. Mm, 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 mm. I mean, if you think about it, writing something for an emulator, it's kind of like reading the Rosetta Stone and then going back in time 2000 years or 3000 years and then trying to talk to an Egyptian, you'd probably sound like an idiot. Small game. So what do I what do I do in this? Do I how do you play this game? <laughs> yeah, there are some glitches. They should really loan this to one of the emulator writers. Then they can make a perfect emulator and make the games work. Oh, I think this game is you have to walk around and then there are certain tiles that are bad or something. I mean once you load the data off of the system, it should just be executing code from the RAM in the cartridge. So what probably happens is the ROM in the cartridge bootstraps it, loads up the RAM, and then it passes the program counter, or basically does a jump instruction over to the RAM's memory, which executes the game. Because normally a Super Nintendo game would execute from the ROM image, but in this case, obviously it's going from RAM. So I'm just kind of wondering where the issue is. Is it now in the game? I mean, the system appears to be doing everything that it's supposed to. Karen, we got it to load discs. It Yay! reads all the discs, woo! Mm, mm, mm. Okay, so we had two homebrew games to try. We had Magic Floor, a puzzle game, and Super Boss Gaiden, a beat-em-up game. Oh yeah. Now, Super Boss Gaiden wouldn't load, but we could get it to load an error message, which is good. We also realized that we can, there's a pretty good amount of play when adjusting the focus tracking and the uh, focus adjustment and the tracking gain. Mm -hmm. It still loads data disks, even if you put those fairly out of whack. Yeah. In fact, if anything, audio disks stop working long before data disks stop working. So now what it's really down to is the homebrew programmers figuring out the differences between their estimated emulator and what the real hardware can do. For instance, the guy who wrote Magic Floor, I sent him the video saying, okay, here's what it's doing, here's the glitched version. He's like, ah, I'm gonna change something in the vertical blank and ignore this interrupt request. And then it worked perfectly. Woohoo! Yeah, we didn't get footage of that for the show, but it just goes to show that now it's down to the programmers learning what the hardware can actually do versus what they thought it can do. We got all the hardware working, hooray! Yep, so we're gonna give it back to Terry at MGC, and now anything else in the future of this console is up to the programmers. Well, that's all the time we have for today. If you have any comments or questions about the Nintendo PlayStation prototype, let us know on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash tbhs. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. So apparently Jennifer Garner and Ben Affleck got back together. 